So ask the Holy Spirit today, like, what would please the Father tonight? Because I know we've been talking about, you know, the supernatural lifestyle. We've been talking about, uh, and, and we're all hungry for that. Let's face it, we are so flipping hungry for the supernatural, for a move of God, to see people saved, healed, delivered, and set free, to see things change. <clears throat> and um, and I'm, I'm still continuing in that vein, but the word that I got was faith, because we can't access any of the supernatural if we're not in faith. And, um, and I think sometimes, you know, we come from a place of, in some areas maybe where we've prayed for people and we haven't seen the healing or we haven't seen the deliverance from drugs or whatever it might be. Sometimes our faith gets affected. Um, sometimes we've been praying for something for ourselves. It seems like for years and no breakthrough and our faith is affected. Um, so I, I just got faith. And, and the more we want to press into the supernatural, the more we want to see the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the goodness of God released in our nation. Uh, I really believe that the stronger in faith we have to be. And faith's a gift. You know, like in Romans 12, 3, God says that he has given us the measure of faith. We have faith. It's his faith. So anytime anybody says, I don't have the faith for that, what they're saying is that in my soul, I can't see that ever happening. But their spirit has the faith. Because your spirit is connected with God and God has given you the measure of faith in your spirit. It's the soul that's the balancing power. It's the soul that either can come into agreement with the spirit or not. So remember we talked about in James chapter 1 that our spirit is born again, but our soul is in the process of being saved. James 1, 20, 21. It's in the process of being saved and, and our body will be. Um, and our mind has to be renewed. And sometimes, you know, just by listening to the way that we speak, we know that um, we're not speaking in line with the word of God. We're, we're speaking out of a place of, of um, I don't know, disenfranchisement, um, uh, out of a place of hurt, shipwrecked faith. And sometimes when God is um, bringing a new revelation, it's almost like we get, um, he shakes us, you know, to get our attention because he's got to change the mindset and move things around. So faith is, um, it's a number of different things, you know, it, uh, it speaks, faith sees, faith hears, faith acts. There's a whole lot of things that faith does, but first of all, and faith is confident. But one of the first things faith is, is that it has to be in the heart. It has to be, you know, he's given us faith, but now our soul's got to come into agreement with this. He's given us a new heart. He's given us a new spirit, Ezekiel 36. We're a brand new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So included in that brand new creation is faith. And Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And I know there's times for me and... and um, and I I'm, I'm, hope I'm the only one. Um, but there are times, you know, when you just tend to go into automatic, just living automatically without, without relying on God because, oh, hey, I can do this. I've done this before. You just mindlessly go about something at work or at home. And there's no real faith involved because you're just doing it. And, uh, and I think we've got to learn to be completely dependent upon God. Because the, the humanism is so strong in the Western psyche. You know, we're so, you know, we're educated, we're intelligent, it's got to be logical, it's got to make sense, all of these things. But Jesus said, I only ever do the things I see my father do. And that to me seems to be a case of dependence upon God and not independence. And part of the Australian psyche is that independent spirit. Is you know we are just an independent. We're just independent. That's part of our psyche, and uh, and to learn to be completely submitted to the Holy Spirit, um, to learn to be to, to be dependent upon God sometimes is a hard lesson. But He says, without faith, it's impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, 
and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Well, I want the rewards. I want the rewards. I want to please him. I want to glorify him with my life. So I really want to come back to, um, to a purity of faith that's not mixed in with anything else. And one of the, the, I don't listen to the news much anymore. I might watch a little bit of Peter Credlin, but I don't watch the news because it is all fear-based. And, um, and, and if you're out there on the streets, that fear is almost palpable in people or there's an anger that they've got it. They've had to be in lockdown. They've had to be in restriction that they've lost their job. So you've got anger and fear. And then there's the depression for those who can't seem to see a way out who, who um, have lost their finances or, or whatever it might be. Uh, and, and we are just the most blessed of all people, you know, because God's hand is on us and, and he's protecting us. We're just blessed. Um, but the, the, the nation is almost pulsating with a combination of fear, anger and depression hopelessness in a way as well so we have to stay make sure that we don't get infected by that that we actually infect other people with faith and hope and goodness and kindness and joy uh, and actually bring the kingdom to earth so um romans 1 17 so we're just going to talk about faith tonight and then at the end, there'll be a little bit of a Q&A. &A. But Romans 1.17 says that the just shall live by faith. You know, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith and I know when I first got born again I kind of kept faith for the big things you know for the the problems problems the troubles I kind of kept faith for that I didn't quite realize that everything had to be lived by faith so even that was learning to surrender and to believe God in in everything and Romans 4 17 is another example of faith it says, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they do. But God's word is forever settled in heaven. I mean, God's word is settled. It's settled in heaven. Jesus brought the word. Jesus, the living word of God, came to earth and manifested God's word upon the earth. His word is settled. It's the first word. It's the final word. It's the only word. It's the only authority. And, and so it's recognizing that uh, it's through faith that you can call the impossible possible. It's through faith that you decree and declare that, um, you know, we can give life to the dead and call those things that be not as though they are. It's, it's, it's faith that in contrary uh, to hope, in hope, believes so that, you know, we become the, Abraham became the father of many nations. Faith takes hold of what is in the natural and puts God super upon it and transforms it into the miraculous, into the supernatural, into the, the answer, the solution, the, the promise of God, whatever it might be. Faith is key. It's the currency of heaven. It is absolutely um, pre prerequisite for everything. And it's not about the, the fact that we, it, it's not, and again, it, it's not works because we've got the grace of God. The grace of God is aligned to the purpose of God for our lives. Uh, and the grace of God is, is our teacher. It says in Titus chapter two, verse 12, that the grace of God teaches us to live a godly life, a righteous life. But the only life that pleases God is one that's lived by faith. And that's quite simply taking his word and believing it. End of story. Trusting in God with all of our heart, leaning not to our own understanding, acknowledging him in all our ways and you know, allowing him to direct and straighten and smooth our path. So it's, it's just simply taking God at his word and, uh, and, and getting the revelation of the word. I think that's the key is the revelation of the word because we can read a, a promise and... Um, 
and use it. But sometimes it's just information. It has yet to become revelation. It's yet to become part of who we are. When you get the revelation, it's almost like the word starts to be manifest in your flesh, like it did with Jesus. Jesus, the word became flesh. So when we get a revelation of the word, that revelation actually starts to manifest in us. We, we just know that we know that we know that we know that that is that we've been healed by his stripes or that, you know, Jesus is our, our deliverer. We, we just know it and no one can talk us out of it. No one can bring any conviction, any argument to make us change our mind in our spirit, in our knower. We just know that's the truth. And so um, this, is, this is why faith is so important, because in, in our world, you have so many other voices. You've got the voice of media. You've got the voice of the financial experts, the economic experts, doctors, bankers. You've got the voice of educators. You've got the voice of, you know, um, newspaper reporters. You've got the voice of friends and, and um, prime ministers. And, and you, so many voices in the world that seem to drown out absolutely everything except drown out God's voice. But Jesus said that, you know, my sheep know me, they know my voice and they follow me. And so what we have to do is learn to drown out the other voices because they take away from faith. When you, you know, I used to work in a place that was so ungodly. I was the only Christian on staff for a little while. 80 people that did not know Jesus Christ. Um, and it was just like, whoa, the language and the lifestyle and everything. It was like a big shock to the system. Uh, and and you had, I had to be careful because it would be very easy to be influenced by them. It's, in, it's easy to, you know, after a while, if you're in that, it's like the, the frog in the hot water that's just slowly cooking, you know, you, you just um, start to, to adapt to their culture and you start to adapt to these things. And, uh, and so it changes. So it's recognizing that the only voice that we want to hear is the voice of the Holy Spirit. The only word that we want to release is the word of God that will pierce people's hearts, that will change things, that will bring hope, bring solutions, bring, bring everything that, that is required. So, um, you know, it's, it's the mandate from God really for all of us is Matthew 6.10 that um, Kat's joining in. Matthew 6.10 that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we want, to bring heaven to earth. That's our mandate. That's what God has called us to do. So one of the other things is, it's all good, May. He's a beautiful cat. One of the other things is, is that faith is confident. Some people will say it's, it's um, arrogant, that it's cocky. You know, who do you think you are? But faith is courageous and faith is confident. If you want to look in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, it says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we've asked of him. But this is the confidence. Faith is confident. Faith is confident that when you come before God, when you come to that throne of grace, um, that he's going to uh, open things up. He's going to change things. He's going to move things around. He's going to answer your prayer. And when that, that word hears, it actually means that um, it's a judicial kind of hearing. It's like the judge hears the case. It's, it's judicial in its context. So this is the confidence that we have in him, that when we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, and we know, we know that he hears us, then whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. And so we don't give up. We don't quit. We don't pull back. We don't fall short. And if the circumstances don't change straight up, if we keep pressing in with the word of God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and, and in the power and the grace of God, then things will change. We just can't quit. Because sometimes you hear a lot of Christians saying things like, oh, you know, I really felt God told me to do this. And then they come back and say, oh, well, it mustn't have been God. It didn't work out. Well, God's not schizophrenic. We've got to really get settled in our relationship with him. 
and learn to recognize his voice. We've got, an, you know, the Holy Spirit has a voice. In Acts chapter 13, verse 2, the Holy Spirit spoke to Paul and to some others, and they knew the voice of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, we've got to know the voice. Jesus said we'd know his voice, the voice of the Father, the voice of Jesus, the voice of the Holy Spirit. So we've just got to, and it's, it's a process. It's not something that happens overnight. It's something we learn. And I don't know how long it went while I kept saying things like, oh God, I hope this is you because I'm going to step out and do this. I'm hoping it's you. It better be you that told me to do this. But we've got to learn. We've got to step out. And it pleases him. And it doesn't matter if we stumble. It doesn't matter if we fall. He picks us up. He puts us back on our feet. And he tells us, go again. Like any dad, he's thrilled with any kind of progress that we make. So it's, it's the um, faith is confident. It's always believing and always moving forward. See, I really believe that the minute you feel stuck, there's a warning right there that something is not right because the kingdom is always advancing. Jesus was never stuck. Jesus was never held back. You know, when, if, if, when he was arrested, it because he knew it was the Father's will, but he was never ever held back. So we've got to start recognizing, why do I feel stuck? Why is it that the finances have stopped? What's happening here? And at the slightest sign of trouble, we stop and we ask the Holy Spirit or we ask Jesus, what is the truth? Because the kingdom is always advancing. I'm not saying that we always have to be advancing, advancing, but we, but being stuck, being um, um, fettered, being held in place, it's not God. We can wait on God, which is strengthening us, uh, and and He can be, you know, talking to us and 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 talking and revealing revelation to us and things like that. But when it starts to feel that there's that bondage, that you know, it doesn't matter what I do, I can't seem to get ahead doesn't matter what I do, the finances just keep drying up. I get a bit of a breakthrough and they dry up again. Understand this is not God. This is not a loving heavenly father. This is not the work of Christ on the cross. This is the work of the enemy or of an unrenewed part of our mind where we're still believing a lie because God is good. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundant. And so any area that when I'm not talking about wealth for wealth's sake, you know, we're, we're called to be blessed to be a blessing. But I'm talking about personal growth. I'm talking about growing in the things of God. I'm talking about maturity. I'm talking about seeing your family saved, seeing people get healed, um, fulfilling the call of God upon your life, recognizing the start of your path so you can start to move into destiny, into what God's called you to do. So the minute you start to feel trapped, the minute you start to feel hemmed in, the minute you start to feel something's not right, stop and ask the spirit of truth to show you what you need to know so that it doesn't grow into a big uh, trap that's keeping you, you know, held for, for years or months. Let's break it off before it gets a chance to develop roots. Let's cut it off before it gets a chance to grow. Let's, let's move in the things of God. And so this faith is confident. We're always moving forward and believing for more. This is Ephesians 3.20, you know, that God does abundantly over and above anything we could ever ask, dream, hope, or imagine. God does abundantly over and above this. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. That's not a need. That's a want. And so this confident faith is always causing us to move forward because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith does not come by watching reality shows. Faith does not come by watching MasterChef. Faith does not come by reading the newspaper. Faith only comes by hearing the word of God, by getting into the scriptures, by, by, by going through the life of Jesus, looking at the, at the epistles. Faith comes by the word. And so at the word is everything. In Psalm 1, it says that, you know, as we're planted by the, the rivers of water, we bring forth fruit and season, our leaf doesn't wither, and every single thing we do prospers. Everything we do prospers. This is the light that, that God has given us to live by. And so it's faith. It's recognizing that we go to him and we say, God, you said that anything I ask in the name of Jesus, you give it to me. So I'm asking for this. Now, there might be a bit of um, argy-bargy in the spirit realm for you to get it, for you to manifest it. 
But the minute you take hold of it and realize that it belongs to you, even if it hasn't manifested in your life, it will happen. So I'm, you all know this one, but turn to Mark 11, 22. Have the faith of God. Have the God kind of faith. Have faith in God. All boils down to the same kind of thing. Have faith in God or have the God kind of faith. Verse 23, assuredly, I say to you, this is Jesus himself speaking. Whoever, are you a whoever? I'm a whoever. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says whatever he says so the thing is there might be you know i'm 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 commanding financial debt to go or i'm commanding pain to go whatever it might be my head might be screaming at me my head might be saying but you've still got the pain in your back you've still got the doctor's report you've still got this that or whatever happening that's happening that's there but it says if you doubt in your heart if it's settled in your heart then you will have what you say. So my head might be screaming saying, I can't see how God's gonna do this. I can't see how it's gonna work. I don't see what God's gonna do. My head might be saying that, but that is not going to affect the outcome of my words, of my decrees, of my confessions, of my prayers, unless I, I actually allow that doubt to get down into my heart. He says, don't doubt in your heart. So that means that you've got that underlying peace. You're believing for God for something outrageous. On the top, there's a little bit of emotional storm because the head's going, you know, cannot conceive how this is going to happen. But in your heart, there's a peace. So as long as you've got that underlying peace, because when you're in peace, you're in faith. That's according to Romans chapter five, verses one and two. If you are in peace, you are in faith. And then in verse um, 24, it says, therefore, I say to you, whatever, again, whatever, that is massive. Like whatever you want, whatever, that's huge. The only restriction is you can't ask for somebody else's husband or wife, you know, that kind of thing, the morals of the word of God. But it's whatever you want, whatever you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive it and you will have it. So the tense of the words here is so important. He says, I say to you, this is Jesus. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive it and you will have it. So when I pray for something, uh, I believe I receive it when I pray. Was the minute I come before his throne room, Father, I ask for, you know, whatever it might be. I ask for a new car. I ask for this. I ask for that. Whatever. When I ask that you teach me to translate. I ask that you teach me to bilocate. I ask that you teach me. Receive, believe you receive it when you pray. And it says that you will have it. You will walk into it. It will come and meet you. It will happen. But the key is to believe you receive it when you pray. So, so I've learned from Fred Price and from other guys that I used to watch on TV when they were on TV and, and bought their books. They would say things like, um, sometimes they would not pray straight up. They would wait until they saw themselves of what they were going to ask God for. Yongi Cho, you know, he had to believe God for a huge amount of money to build the church. He did not pray about it until he saw himself with the money. Fred Price said sometimes he would take a week to think about what to pray because he knew his prayers would get answered. And so he wanted to make sure that his prayer was right. It's not like you have to be legalistic or, or anything like that. But if you can't see yourself with what you're asking for, you're not in faith because faith sees. Faith sees sees so if you can't then you start you know the holy spirit show me the reality of what it would be like for me to have this prayer answered show me the reality of what it would be like to be living debt free holy spirit show me the reality so that you start to build within you the sight of faith so that you see yourself with it and like i've said so many times you know like i love to buy books and mostly i buy them 
from Amazon or or um, Booko or Thrift Books or whatever. And when I buy them, the minute I've hit pay, that book belongs to me. It's not in my hands. It hasn't even come to my front door. It's still on the bookshelf in Amazon or Booko or wherever it might be. But my name is on that invoice. I've paid the money. I have it. It is my book. And so it will come off that bookshelf. It will go in the mail. It will come to my front door into my hot little hands and I will have another book for my bookshelves and I will be thrilled. So but the thing is, I get it the minute I hit pay. So the minute we pray in the name of Jesus, we receive what we pray for. We receive it then and it will come. That's why when you read the word, it's so important that you look at the, um, the tense of the verbs and, and all of that. So whatever things you ask, whatever things you ask, isn't that amazing? Whatever things you ask. You know, and in, in Isaiah, it says in the Passion Translation, I can't remember the verse, but it says, ask for something so big that only God could do it. Let's stretch our faith. Let's ask for something so big that only God could do it. Because sometimes our prayers are pretty safe. You know, we, we ask for something that, well, yeah, I, can, I believe that, that God could do this. Or, you know, it's a, it doesn't take a lot of faith. But let's honor God and ask for something really big, really, really big. You know, I'm, I'm reading a book. I don't know what it's called because I'm reading a lot of books at the moment. Um, but it's about a, a, an orphanage in Guatemala. And it was Christmas. And the little orphans were standing around and, and the woman who's running it um, says, um, I've got a scripture coming for Faith Sees, Robin, so I'll get that to you in a minute. So the woman running the orphanage says to the kids, you know, what would you like for Christmas? And they said, ah, one boy said, oh, I want a merry-go-round. And she's kind of like, gulp, this is an orphanage. And this kid wants a merry-go-round. And then she thought about it and she said, well, you know what? Jesus can do that. So let's pray. So they prayed for a merry-go-round. And then the next day they thanked God for a merry-go-round. And the next day they thanked God for a merry-go-round. And do you know what? Somebody rang them not even knowing what they had prayed and said, we want to give you a merry-go-round. So the kids got that for Christmas. But on top of that, on top of that, somebody rang from America and said, we just feel it on our heart. God's told us to bless you and the orphans in Guatemala this year. Can we build you a playground? So the children got a playground and a merry-go-round. Like this is an Ephesians 3.20 thing. So we've got to start recognizing God is so much bigger than what we think he is. He's so much bigger than what we can imagine. He created everything. He created everything. And we, we pray these little prayers thinking, oh, well, you know, maybe I have to suffer in this lifetime or this is maybe the way it is. And I hear so many Christians say, well, it is what it is. No, it's not. It is subject to change. Everything is subject to change except the word of God, except the nature of our God. But everything is subject to change. Anything temporal, anything that, um, you know, anything, anything, any sickness and disease, any financial problems, any toxic relationships, everything is subject to change. It is not it is what it is. That's a lie from the pit of hell. We can change anything with the power of the Holy Ghost, the truth of God's word, the grace of God being released into the situation, the mercy of God kissing it. We can do anything. And so it's recognizing that God is a heck of a lot bigger than what we think or what we can imagine. And we've got to start to honor him by really praying for some stuff. You know, um, Jenny, for your book, that somebody will come along and say, you know what, I really believe in you, I believe in your book, so I'm going to pay for the publishing. And somebody's going to come along and underwrite everything. You know, why not ask for that? The Holy Spirit's the author. He's authored the biggest book there is, the Bible. He knows how to organize books. He can do it. So, you know, we've got to start allowing our mindset to expand with the wonders and the glories of an amazing God and what he's calling us to do and to live. Little prayers, safe prayers aren't going to change anything. 
but it's prayers that recognize he's the creator of the universe that he makes the dead to live, the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak. He's the one that delivers addicts off of heroin and ecstasy and ice. He's the one who, who brings shattered families back together again. He's the one who does it all. He's the one who restores what's been lost and what's been stolen by the canker worm. He's the one. And so it's coming back into that and saying, God, I know you're so big. I know you're so amazing. So I'm just going to release my faith in you in who you are, and I'm going to pray for this. This is a whatever for me. This is my whatever, God. This is massive for me, but I know that you can do it because you're awesome. You, we've got to start releasing our faith. And I think one of the challenges is that, um, you know, th there's so much prophetic word available. Um, not that I'm speaking against prophets by any means, but there is so much available and there's so much in books and DVDs and CDs and downloads and, you know, MP3s and MP4s and everything else. But sometimes we just don't really press in for ourselves. It's easier to get a word from, you know, um, a prophet online or it's easier to hear something. But what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What is he wanting you to believe for? What is he laying out before you and just whispering in your ear? You know, if you ask God for this, things are really changed. God is on your side. Remember, it's all rigged in our favor. Everything works together for our good. We love God. We're called according to his purpose. We're broken out of the law of sin and death. We're in the cycle of, of life in Christ Jesus. It's all in our favor. So it's, it's like learning to live. Like, you know, like we see in the Bible, people like Paul and Peter and um, Luke and, and King David and Moses and all of these people. But they're just people. My goodness me. Noah might have been saved from the flood, but he ended up, at, but he, had a, he, he was a drunk as well, you know. He got off the ark and the first thing he did was get roaring drunk. David was a murderer and an adulterer. They're not perfect people, guys. They are not perfect people. They're just like us. And so, you know, and who was it? One of the prophets walked around, preached naked for three and a half years. Seriously. Who's going to listen to his words? You know, so with all of these guys, we think they're so great. They're so marvelous, but they're human. They've got weaknesses, they've got tendencies, they've got foibles, they've got idiosyncrasies, just like us. But they took hold of how amazing and how great God is. And they stepped into the greatness of God. And they were great, not because they were great men and women of God, but because the God they serve was so great. This is the key. It's, it's who we serve. It's the one we, we live for. It's the one that we, we adore. It's the one we exalt, the one we worship. I was on a um, Zoom, I've had so many Zoom calls today, but I was on one this morning with some um, people in the States. And on that was a pastor, get this, who has built his church and started a church right next to a Planned Parenthood, right next door, side by side, Planned Parenthood church. And so they have worship gatherings of 600 people just worshiping God next to Planned Parenthood. How amazing is this? How amazing is this? You know, they're just taking it right on. They're releasing the spirit of life against the spirit of death. They're releasing the sacrifice of Jesus against the sacrifices of Moloch. They're doing it. So it's just an incredible thing. So it's, it's, it's recognizing that God is amazing. He's not calling us to live a little life. He's calling us to do something incredible. He's calling us to do something that, that is just beyond our normal understanding. You know, there's no way Paul would have thought he would ever have written two thirds of the New Testament. I mean, he was a terrorist to the church. He's hauling people off to jail because of what they believed. Then he gets knocked off his horse, has an encounter with Jesus Christ, which is amazing. 14 years in the wilderness, comes back, starts to move with the local church, recognizing that even though he's supremely qualified, he's called to the Gentiles. And so he comes to the Gentiles and he preaches and he teaches. Who would have thought that the... the the main persecutor of the early church would write two thirds of the New Testament. I mean, this, you know, like God's destiny for you 
is so much bigger than what you think it is. So how about you take your hands off and just say, God, I don't know what it is you've called me to do, or I think I've got an idea, but I tell you what I want, God. I want everything you've got for me. I want to be yeah. the, the person. Who's she talking to me? I want to be the person you've called me to be. I want to be um, everything you've called. I want to do everything you've called me to do. I want this. You know, so, but we control God in so many ways because we don't release our faith because of the, the power of our words, because we don't lift our eyes to see things from his perspective. And so we, we keep this little bit of faith and we keep this little domesticated God instead of allowing him to be the wild, outrageous, powerful, creative, innovative, radical God that he is. And it's, you know, he's calling us to this life of adventure this life of, of um, greatness in Christ. And, and we're kind of content and content is good, but not if content keeps you in the same place all the time. You know, you've got to be hungry for the things of God. You've got to be hungry. I mean, I'm so hungry. I can't stand myself. I just want more. I just want more. I want more revelation. I want more understanding of his ways. But you know what I want? I want him. I want him more than I've ever wanted anything in my life. I just want him. I want to flow with him. I want to please him. I, I want to understand him. I want to just, you know, like whatever you want, God, whatever. He says to us here, whatever you want when you pray. Oh, we need to take the same thing because of covenant and say, God, whatever you want with me, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's just, let's just go for it. Let's just no more safe living, no more safe lives. Let's just go for it. Because if we can't trust him, then what can we trust? What can we trust? He's able to do so much more. And so, you know, it's, it, let's break the box of our thinking, our, uh, the box that we keep ourselves in. My father, bless his heart, would always say, oh, well, I'm on a fixed income, chick. Always called me chick, but it was always, oh, I'm on a fixed income. Like when he said that, he acknowledged that there was no way for increase. I'm on a fixed income. What he was saying is my income will never change. This is what I get. This is what it is. It will never change. There was no faith in that. It was an acceptance of a circumstance. There was no, no faith. And we can't afford to accept our circumstances because circumstances are subject to change. Circumstances are always subject to change. Doctors' reports are always subject to change. Bank statements are always subject to change. So we've got to, you know, sort of like whatever you want, God. So faith is confident, confident that, that he's, and, and the Proverbs 3.26 actually says that the Lord is your confidence, firm and strong. That's the amplified. The Lord is your confidence, firm and strong, and he keeps your foot from being caught in a trap or some hidden danger. So because he's your confidence, he's your safety. He's your protector. He's, he's that one. So, uh, you know, and, and remember, too, that, that faith acts. Faith without works is dead. Like if I'm believing God for a new car, then I get my car detailed. I get it cleaned up. I get the garage cleaned out, ready for my new car. I've checked my budget to make sure that I can afford, if it's a BMW, I make sure that you can afford the, the services and the tires and the insurance that would go up but you prepare for it faith is not thank you god i believe i receive and then sitting down and waiting for something to drop in your lap faith is actually preparing for the manifestation of it it's the preparation for it it's like you know i'm believing god for a new job so okay i'm gonna i'm gonna need a work wardrobe or I, I'm, I'm going to need this or I'm going to need that. It's preparing for the receiving of it. It's not just sitting down. Sometimes I think, you know, we sort of sit down and we think, oh, well, I've tithed and I've offered. It's up to God now. I've prayed. It's up to God now. It's all in God's hands. That's not faith. That's an ex that's almost like a, um, I don't even, like, like a, I don't know what to call it, but it's not faith because faith works. Faith prepares to receive what you've asked for. You know, so um, 
or, or, or at least you know like if um like jenny for your book you know um faith you've, you've prayed about it you you've written it you've edited it it's getting ready to be published you've organized copyright for the songs and all of that kind of stuff so now it's like hey father i just want to thank you that that there is an alignment with the right person to bring the publishing the marketing the advertising whether i self-publish or or it goes through a, a you know a publishing company so you start to pray these things through even if there's nothing in the natural you start to pray it through to you get a settled path on the inside that this is what's going to happen and you see in your mind's eye that your book is number one on the Kurong book sales that you're up there number in the top 10 that, you know you've, you've reached it that this is what you're doing this is how you you're seeing it you actually approach Kurong and say look I've written this book how do we how can I get it in here if, if you're going to self-publish it's actually doing something so it's, but again it's not works for work's sake it's being led by the Holy Spirit because you are working in tandem with God to receive what you've prayed for. So faith without works is dead. And, uh, and you know, um, it is just, it's just exciting. It is just so exciting when you start to, to realise how, how faith works and how to walk it out with God, recognising that everything in the kingdom belongs to you because you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And if you are a joint heir with Jesus Christ, whatever he had belongs to you finished there's no argument over that you're a joint heir with christ whatever he had belongs to you faith is also a weapon you know it's it's an evidence when you go to the courts of heaven faith is is evidence um, so it's evidence in the courts when you stand in the courts you go well part of the evidence is my faith my faith, I believe I received. My faith, I've stood on the word of God. My faith, I've spoken out according to the word of God. So faith is evidence that you can use in the courts of heaven. Um, faith is also, you, you know, the shield that quenches every fiery dart of the enemy. So it's it's active. You know, you've got the, the darts coming from, you're feeling like you're being persecuted. You feel like every time you turn around that you're just being hit by something else. Put up the shield of faith. Quench every fiery dart of the enemy. Bam! Just let it hit that shield of faith because Jesus is your faith. He's the author. He's the finisher of your faith. It's all about Jesus. He is your faith. He's the beginner of it. He's the end of it. And all you've got to do is step out in it in the middle. Join the beginning, join the end. Bring it together. But Jesus is your faith. And so he's your shield. He is your protection. He's the one who stands there. He's the one who crops it for you. He did it at the cross. He took your place at the cross. And now in this life, he stands with us and he deflects all the fiery darts of the enemy and keeps you safe and keeps you protected. That's our Jesus. He is amazing. So faith is aggressive. You know, it's a, it's a weapon, it's a shield. Uh, have a look in 1 Timothy 6.12. I just hope you get so stirred up tonight that you really start asking for a whole heap of stuff and, and destiny and assignments and everything else that he's got for you. You know, it says in 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. That means that any time um, doubt, unbelief, um, fear, any of those things come, say, no, in Jesus' name, that's not in the kingdom, it's not going to be in my life. I rebuke that. Get out in Jesus' name. Fight the good fight of faith. Stand firm. You know, when you, your knees are buckling, when you think, my goodness, I don't think I can take any more. I don't know where the next dollar is coming from. I don't know what the doctor's going to say with the next report. I don't know if I can handle this toxic relationship another second. You stand. You stand. Having done everything, you stand. And you fight the good fight of faith. You say, you know what? I just believe God. God is going to turn all things around for my good. God's hand is on my life. God will change this. God will stop this. God will do it. I'm standing in agreement with God. He is all powerful. He's on my side. I'm because of Jesus Christ, I'm more than a conqueror. Because of Jesus Christ, I'm an overcomer. Because of Jesus Christ, I always triumph in him. And so it's fighting that good fight of faith. It's recognizing I cannot accept doubt, fear, unbelief. I can't accept those things. They're not, it's not the truth. It's not God's word. It's not the character 
character of God. I will not be a partaker of, of a satanic nature. And those things are of a satanic nature because there's only two natures, God's and the devil's. Human nature's in the middle. So I'm not going to be a partaker of anything except the divine nature. So I fight the good fight of faith. I fight it. I'm going to stand in faith. I'm going to speak faith. I'm going to agree with God's word. I'm going to agree with Jesus and what he did for me at that cross. I'm going to stand in the grace of God. I'm going to stand in the mercy of God. I'm going to stand in faith and fighting the good fight. It's, uh, it's just so Im imperative that we recognize that faith is a fight. It is a fight. That's what Timothy says. I want you to understand that sometimes you have to, having done everything, stand. Stand. Stand in victory. Stand in Christ. Stand in faith. Just turn to Romans chapter 5 for a minute. And this is where peace is so important. Romans chapter 5. Because therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So because I've been justified by faith, because I've believed in what Jesus did for me, I'm justified as if I'd never sinned. And I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also I have access by faith into this grace in which I stand. And I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we've got a uh, faith is an access. To stand in the grace of God. Faith is your gateway. Faith opens the door so that you can stand in the grace of God, in the mercy of God, in the goodness of God, in the covenant of God, and walk in everything that he has. Remember that that um, the grace of God is, is like without grace, we wouldn't get saved. But the grace of God, according to Peter, is aligned with your purpose. Every time you step into the purpose of God, there is a grace released on your purpose. The grace and purpose were given to you before the beginning of time. So grace and purpose go together. And I always know when I've overstepped my time because there is no, um, there's no grace. There's just no grace whatsoever. It's so hard. What was like the jobs that I've had in the past when it was time to move on and I didn't move on at the right time. I was not obedient. I knew what God was saying, but I thought oh, I'm going to wait till I have another job and then I'll quit. Doesn't work because I stayed in that job and it, what was a fabulous job and so easy became the hardest thing I ever did in my life. God said, you're not in my purpose. The grace isn't there for that. Now the grace to be saved is there. The grace to, to, you know, to be a Christian was there, but the grace for my purpose was aborted because I was no longer in my purpose. And it's recognizing as well that grace teaches us. Grace is a teacher to live a godly life, to be righteous. And that's in Titus chapter two, verse 12. So there's a whole lot of different aspects of grace, which is a wonderful thing, but it's only through faith that we can actually stand in the in the um, in the grace that God has given to us, faith hears. You know, um, faith hears. Turn to Isaiah thirty twenty one. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. He who has ears to hear. So in Isaiah chapter thirty, let me just find it, verse twenty one. As your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. So you're going to hear the voice of the good shepherd. You're going to hear that voice. It might not be an audible voice. It might be an inner voice. You might even um, hear through dreams. You know, um, God has numerous ways of talking to us. Um, I think I've only heard the audible voice twice the rest of the time it's been inner and sometimes it's more like a thought that just kind of rises to the top of my being just you should do this and I think ah oh, no you know I'm not going to do that and I push it away but it just gently comes back and just stays at the top of my thoughts it doesn't push me it doesn't cause me to strive it doesn't drive me one way or the other I have free will to do with that thought whatever I want to do and that's when I know it's God when something is pushing striving, driving you to do something, more often than not, it is the enemy. 
So it's recognizing that, that faith gives you ears to hear. It gives you ears to hear. And like I said before, there are mainly only three voices on the planet, the voice of God, the voice of Satan, and the voice of people. And that's it. So we've got to make sure that we're listening to the right voice. Um, if you want to have a look in, in John 8, 44. John 8, 44. This is the voice of Satan. It says, this is Jesus speaking. And he's saying, um, John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, but he is a liar and the father of it. So he speaks, he speaks lies. Um, so that's why we've got to be very aware that whatever we hear lines up with the truth of God's word that his word is pure and his word is right. So Satan lies. He does not know how to speak truth. Um, let me just turn to Proverbs 28, verse 26. Proverbs 28, verse 26. It says, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. So, you know, remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, who trust in the Lord, with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, lean not to your own voice, lean not to your own idiosyncrasies, to your own worldview, lean not to what you think is right. Because if you think it's right and it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's still wrong. So lean not to your own understanding, lean into God. You know, like um, Colossians 1.9 says that we are filled with the full, deep and clear knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We need to have spiritual understanding, not human understanding, not human logic. That is secondary. But first of all, we need wisdom and we need um, spiritual understanding because that is what releases um, the ways for us to walk worthy of God, to bear fruit in every good work, to, to grow in the knowledge of God and things like that. And faith speaks. Faith speaks. In the, um, in the book I'm reading about the orphanage in Guatemala, the lady there um, had, took one of the children in. They were given a, a, a child to, to take and um, and he had to or had the symptoms of tuberculosis, and so she took him to the hospital to get tested. And the doctor said, "Oh, you know, this is this is classic tuberculosis." And she said, "He does not have tuberculosis." And the doctor said, "No, this is classic symptoms. He has." And she said, "No, he does not have tuberculosis." She said, I didn't raise my voice. I wasn't angry. I didn't say he was wrong. I just said, "No, he does not have it." So the doctor took whatever sample he needed to take, looked at it and said, this is classic tuberculosis. This child has tuberculosis. And she just said, no, he does not. And as the doctor's walking out of the room, he turns back and he says, this child has tuberculosis. And she just said, no, he does not. And when the test came back, he did not. So it's recognizing that you have to take a stand. You cannot accept the lies of the enemy. You cannot accept human understanding. It is not God. It is not the wisdom of God, the will of God, the way of God. It's not the power of God. And so we don't need to get into arguments. We don't need to cause strife because that's immediately stepping into the enemy's territory. But just very quietly, we can just say, well, I disagree with that. I disagree with that and just leave it at that. But no, he does not have tuberculosis. So we've got to you know, start recognizing what are you speaking over your life? Are you speaking from a human soul aspect? I'm not asking you to sound like a King James Bible, but I am asking you to take a stand on the word of God. And that's why it's so important, particularly in this end, look, I don't know how close to the end we are. I don't know, it could be two years, 20 years, two, who knows when God is coming back? Not even the angels know, not even Jesus knows. It's getting closer with every day, but we don't know when he's coming back. The thing is that we've got to know the word of God so that we cannot be deceived. 
and you do not want to know the word of God the way people say we should know it. You need to know it the way God wrote it. You know, so when you open your Bible, Father, let me know the word the way you wrote this. Show me your heart. Show me what your, show me what your will is. Why, how, what, you know, show me how you wrote this love letter to me because the word is his love letter to us. It's how to live. It's how not to live. It's how he wants us to have days of heaven upon the earth. It's how he wants us to release the kingdom of God upon the earth. People being saved, healed, delivered, set free. All of these amazing, beautiful, wonderful things that we can release wisdom and change communities and change families and, and just bring redemption and salvation into people's lives. And so it's recognizing that faith speaks and I'm not quite sure where it is. It's Second Corinthians, um, could be five or seven, not quite sure. But it says, having the same spirit of faith, we speak. So faith is a spirit and faith speaks. I think it's Second Corinthians five. I'm not quite sure where though. But we walk by faith and we don't walk by sight. We do not walk by sight. It's not by what you see in the natural. It's not how circumstances are lining up. Oh my gosh, if we make decisions based upon how circumstances are lining up, that is walking by sight. God said that we are to walk by faith. That's listening to the Holy Spirit, hearing the leading of the Holy Spirit, being led by him. If I say, oh, well, it looks like, you know, this, this, this is lining up really nicely, it could be a setup of the enemy. That's looking at things from a natural point of view. I need to see things from a heavenly perspective, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit leading us. It's not about works. It's about relationship. It is about just walking life out with the Holy Ghost in such a beautiful way that, um, you know, the kingdom of heaven just comes down. Genesis 15.5. We'll finish with this. And then if anyone's got any questions, I love faith. Honestly, it was the only way when my kids were little that we got food on the table. It was the only way that sometimes that we were able to pay the, the bills. I, I, faith, I, I just, it was all I had. I didn't have enough money. I didn't have enough of anything. But I knew that God had given me the measure of faith. And I was so blessed that my pastor said, Everything is in the word. Whatever you face, the answer is in the word of God. And so they taught me, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, that my God meets my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, that I've been healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ, you know, um, that I can speak peace to the storm that's brewing. And they taught me so much that everything was in the word. Everything came out of the word of God. And so when you allow the word of God and the Holy Spirit Come together there is an explosion of the life of God and the power of God and the miracles of God and things change but we you know we either lean too much to the word or we we're too much into the Holy Spirit there's got to be this this blending this coming together of the two so like in Genesis 1 when God said let there be and he released the word the Holy Spirit came and connected with the word and creation was was there so but this, we've got to have the same kind of speak the word and, and respond to the Holy Spirit so that it can be what it can be. In Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, God is speaking to Abram and he's making a covenant with him. And, um, and Abram's saying in verse 2, Lord God, what are you going to give me? Seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir, meaning a slave. And then the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Now, just to receive that statement would take faith because Abram knew how old he was. He knew how old his wife was. He knew that there was no way they could have children. And yet God is saying, uh, one who comes from your own body shall be your heir. So God is saying, I'm going to bring something supernatural to pass. It's going to be miraculous. It's going to be marvelous. It's going to be something beyond belief that Abram, I can do this. So he brought Abram outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. 
And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. That is an incredible thing. Come outside, look up at the stars and start counting. I mean, that in itself is an impossibility. Like you start counting, you know, one, two, three. Um, no, I'm not sure if I've counted that one or not. So you go back and start again. But he says, count the stars if you can, because that's how many descendants there are going to be for you. Like beyond number, Abraham, beyond what you can fathom, beyond what you can mentally take in. That's what I'm, I'm the number of descendants that I am going to give you. But in verse six, Abraham said, it says, he believed in the Lord. He believed in the Lord. All we have to do is believe in Jesus. That's pretty simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your household. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be healed by his stripes. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're set free from every demonic assault and attempt against you. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and your path will open up and he will show you the path of life. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for he is the way, the truth and the life. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, you know, if you're saying, God, I don't know which way I'm supposed to go. Jesus is the way you're supposed to go because he will lead, he is the way and he will lead you into your own personal path. When you say, God, I'm not sure what the truth is. Jesus is the truth. And as you stay close to Jesus, every lie is revealed, exposed and destroyed. And, you, you know, Jesus' life is so hard or the doctors have said, I don't have much life left, but Jesus is your life. You are already an eternal being. You already have eternal life. Everything is yours. Everything is yours. Whatever you ask for, whatever you want. What an amazing promise of God, whatever you want. And then in 3 John 2, above all things, above everything, I want you to prosper. I want you to live in health, even as your soul prospers. How good is our God? It's not rocket science. It's not hard. It's just recognizing the only voice we listen to is the voice of the word of God. Jesus Christ alone. Not according to, you know, and, and whatever I say, man, check it out in the word for yourself. Check it out for yourself. And, you know, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? So out of what I've spoken here tonight, the Holy Spirit would have said something different to everybody. Because everybody's in a different place. Everybody's got a different need. Everybody's got a different perspective. God knows exactly where you are at. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows your comings in and your goings out. So the important thing is what has the Holy Spirit said to you tonight? What has been highlighted to you tonight? That's what you look at. That's what you concentrate on. That's what you follow. Because, you know, you, you can't take everything in. It's only what the Holy Spirit highlights. That's the truth that he wants you to follow for this, this season of your life. It's just, he's just awesome. He is just absolutely awesome. And we've got to really understand and believe that his plan for you is so much better than you could ever imagine. So much more fulfilling than you ever thought possible. And when you, when you live out his plan, yet there will be challenges. That's why we're overcomers. That's why we're more than conquerors. That's why the, sh the faith is a shield. But when you start to walk it out, your heart sings because you're doing what God has called you to do. You just know that it's right. You just know. And there's just such a peace and such a joy and such a contentment and such an excitement. Um, it's just wonderful. But we can talk about a supernatural lifestyle. We can talk about ascending. We can talk about translating and bilocations and everything else. But if faith is not the foundation, then nothing is going to happen. 
Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Impossible to please him without faith. And then he says, you know what, to make it sure that you do please me, I'll give you the measure of faith. Jesus will be the author and the finisher of the faith. The word of God, every time you hear the word of God, it will hearing the word will bring faith. He's made it almost impossible for us to fail if we just follow the word, the, the relationship with him.